Hey friends, I wanted to come on here and talk about the Lemurian wound because it feels to me like a whole new depth, <clears throat> a whole new depth and whole new like layer, multiple layers of the Lemurian wound is being opened up and revealed to us right now. And so I wanted to talk about it in case anybody else is resonating. I know that some people are because they've told me, but I just want to preface this by saying that this is stuff that I have found through Akashic Records readings, both on myself and other people. This is not anything that I am trying to sell to you as a belief system. It's very, very important at this time that you construct your own belief system. So take what works for you and leave what doesn't. If this is not resonating for you, then it just means that this is not part of your Akashic history no problem. You've got your own other stuff to consider. But the Lemurian wound. Okay, I'll tell you what I have found and what I perceive and what I think is going on right now. So to me, what I have found is that the Lemurian time was the original golden age on earth. It might have been in the third and fourth dimension, but I actually think it was probably fourth and fifth dimensional um, expression of earth. We were humans very much looking like we do now, but we were more um, plasma, light bodies, meaning that we did not have the same issues with density that we do now. We did not have the same diseases. We did not have the same imbalances in our bodies. Our bodies felt very light because they literally were plasmatic light. And we felt um, very free. We were all connected through our heart with each other. It was like, I call it the heartopathic network because it's like a form of telepathy, but instead of it being a transmission of thoughts, or images, it's more like that empathic quality that a lot of us have who are in my field, people who are in the process of awakening or have been on an awakening journey for a long time. We are empaths, we're empathic, we can feel other people's feelings. It was like that, but without being excruciating and horrible because <laughs> we were all empathically open. We were all linked up and connected through our heart center. And so we could feel each other. So when somebody else was hurt, you would feel it like it's your own hurt. When you're hurt, you're surrounded by a whole community of other people, all of whom feel your hurt and to whom it matters just as much as it matters to you. And so we treated each other very differently because we could all feel everything that anyone else is feeling, right? So as you can imagine, I don't wanna to spend too much time going into it, but the way that we organize ourselves as a group, as a society, a community, whatever shitty modern terms we wanna use, because none of those feel right, the ways we organized ourselves were very, very different. And the ways we related to each other were very, very different. The things we did with our time, with our life force energy, the things that we created, our priorities, very different than what we are currently existing within right now. And so, as I said, to me, it is the original golden age. Now, it's as far back as I see on earth. There might be things that precede that. I don't know. Um, but I see this period that is, it feels like new and fresh and innocent. It feels mostly like, like the divine feminine was like just slightly in the lead, but the divine feminine, divine masculine were very much in total harmony with each other. And as I said, life was very beautiful. We had families. Um, fertility was a totally different experience then. Conception was all conscious. There were absolutely no oopsies, and there was also no struggle to conceive. There were different seasons of conception. It wasn't just um, monthly as it is right now. It was just a totally different experience. And then at some point, something happened that I don't have the full information for yet. It feels like there was an invasion and I really hesitate to use these terms because I just don't like the way that has all been framed and I don't want to contribute to more sort of like ungrounded, I don't know, thinking I say as I talk about Lemuria. But anyway, it felt like it was an invasion of what we would know as reptilian people. However, I, if you've ever listened to my things, um, 
especially if you're in any of my courses, you know that I don't think that the reptilians are responsible for everything. I don't actually think the issue is the lizard turds. I agree with uh, what is said in the Bible that it is principalities and powers, meaning that it is non-physical, disincarnate consciousness fields that influence us. We are just as easily influenced as any other group. And one could argue that perhaps um, reptilians and other groups are more easily influenced because they, because of the, basically the patterning of their thoughts. And anyway, I don't want to, I don't want to digress. The point is, I'm just not wanting to contribute to that whole thing about like, oh, it's the reptilians. It's always the reptilians. But in this case, it feels like it was reptilians that came in, meaning that it felt like a totally different species. It did not feel like it was another group of humans that came and invaded humans. It feels like it was something that came in from outside of our little bubble. Now, where they came from, all that stuff, I don't know. I have some theories. I don't want to get into it right now. The thing that feels important to see right now is that initial wound of devastation where basically what happened was an invading force came in let's just call it that an invading force and uh they basically ransacked the civilization absolutely massacred the people um separated families took a lot of the females, the female Lemurians into basically like sex slavery to become um, breeders and also took children for various reasons. So separated um, mothers and children, separated husbands and wives, separated children and fathers. A lot of, in my, what I've seen, a lot of the men were killed and so anybody who carries that Lemurian wound, anybody who has, um, who was alive and has that in their Akashic history, you might be feeling this in a very tender way right now. And it might be coming up in ways that you're not necessarily connecting to that memory. Because also as those memories come through, they feel so surreal and they feel like it just feels so distant and so unrelated to anything that's happening right here and now that it's very normal to question oneself and be like, am I just making this up? In fact, I was talking to a friend who we've had conversations about Lemuria before. So when I had a new layer of the memory come through, I was telling her about it and I followed it up by saying, maybe I'm just delusional but I know that what I'm tapping into is real, whether I'm describing it properly or not, the actual energetic behind it is real because of the devastation I feel and the amount of crying and like the emotional, um, the emotional process of processing it. That is absolutely real. So I know that whatever I'm tapping into is real, even if I might be misdescribing it. But as I sat with it, over the weekend, I knew that I was not, I'm not delusional. I'm not misdescribing it because I have met, I would say, I was going to say countless other people, but it's not countless. It's actually counted. There is a, it's a fairly small handful of maybe like 10 to 20 other people so far that Lemuria has come up in their Akashic records. Now, of course, there are more, but sometimes those memories aren't available to be seen, even in Akashic reading. Like, definitely the information that comes through in Akashic reading is mediated by what are known as the record keepers, meaning that you don't just get free access to everything in your own Akashic field, whether you're doing your own reading or somebody else is doing one for you. Contrary to popular, perhaps, misconception, Akashic record readers cannot just see everything about your soul. There are things that we are not allowed to see until we are ready to see them. You know, like, there are things that would not benefit us to see until other pieces of the puzzle have fallen into place so that we can make sense of it. Case in point, I'm having my own deep Lemurian remembering right now that I don't think I would have been able to handle five years ago before I started doing readings for other people who had um, lifetimes in Lemuria. 
So it's like I needed pieces of the puzzle in order to really understand it. But as you can imagine, this memory is extremely painful. A lot of people also carry Atlantean memories, memory of the Atlantean cataclysm. Now, I don't know if there was a cataclysm related to Lemuria or not, um, but if it was, it feels like it was after this uh, invasion. Like the real trauma point around Lemuria is the invasion, whereas with Atlantis, it feels like the invasion was there right from the start. So people alive during the Atlantean period didn't really know that for a long time. Very similar to what we're experiencing now as a collective. Like we are becoming increasingly aware that there has been um, a dark consciousness woven almost inextricably through the fabric of our society since whatever, since the start, whatever that means, for a very long time. And we're becoming increasingly aware of it now. But for a long time, the majority of us, as just your average citizen, we were not aware of it. So that's similar to what it was like in Atlantis, where it feels to me like that dark consciousness was always there. And it was just very subtle for a long time until it started to grow and then it was easier to see it. And the disruption between I don't know, you could call them factions. I hate describing it in that way too because these are all narratives of extreme polarization and any narrative ex of extreme polarization is the exact thing that we are supposed to overcome now because otherwise we can never get out of this repeating cycle of just fucking living it out over and over and over and over and over. We have to unify these polarities otherwise it'll play out forever. But the the dissonance between those extreme factions in Atlantis was what caused the cataclysm that caused that continent to recede underwater. So I can't speak as much. I mean, I, I'm not personally experiencing Atlantean memories right now. That's not really the way that it's playing out for me. It is Lemurian memories. Lemuria feels more closely connected to to me, um, like for me personally, in my perception, it feels more closely connected to um, Pleiadian beings, Lyran beings, and Andromedan beings. Atlantean stuff feels very connected to Sirius, like the Sirius star um, configuration and Syrian beings. But again, these are just my perceptions. It's not like I can like research the history of these things from credible sources. All I can do is compile my perceptions that I've gathered through various Akashic readings. Anyhow, needless to say, we have seen the scenario that I described from Lemuria play out over and over and over. The scenario of an outside force coming in and disrupting a very harmonious and beautiful culture and separating families. We've seen it play out through, like all across earth so many times. This trauma has repeated itself so many times. And I am sure that if we were to be allowed to see our full Akashic history, much to our deep pain and shame and regret, I imagine that the majority of us have participated on both sides of the way that it has played out because it caused such an incredible fragmentation. I mean, I don't know, as somebody who has lost a child in this life, I honestly don't know if there is anything that... Um, is harder for the psyche to cope with than that. And I don't mean to compare traumas. There's nothing to be gained. It's not a pissing contest of whose trauma is worse. But it's very fresh and close to the surface for me right now. And what I can feel is that it actually makes parents and children like fragment intensely because it's so unnatural for families to be separated. It's so unnatural. So basically what that means is that whenever we go through a really intense experience like this in any of our lifetimes in our Akasha, um, a fragmentation almost always occurs. 
I can say that I have experienced fragmentation, intense fragmentation around this particular trauma, which means that you separate a part of your consciousness from that memory. So you sever. So there's a part of you that is living in that trauma forever, forever until it is released um, by being witnessed, basically. But the witness, which is the other part of you, can't handle it. And so it separates and kind of abandons the part that is reliving the trauma forever. And the witness part of us, the objective observer, is like, I can't, I don't know how to process this. <clears throat> this is too much. So I need to break off and just go live a bunch of other lifetimes. And we leave pieces of our soul living out that trauma forever, which is then why we experience karmic relationships and karmic patterns and twin flame relationships and just like all kinds of, you know, codependent romantic fuckery and, and just like, you know, having children with people that it seems like it's not, it's not a match for us to stay together forever because there is a piece of our soul that is living out that trauma and is just like, it's trapped there just cycling through it forever, waiting for the observer part of us to come back and observe it and see it. And when it's kind of like, like I remember when I realized how impactful the process of witnessing is. It is instrumental in healing. Like if you take, let, let's take it out of Lemuria for a minute and let's bring it back down to like the grounded reality that we can all agree upon. So we'll just forget about past lives for a moment. And we'll talk about this current life and we'll just talk about the way trauma is experienced in this current life. If you experience a trauma in your childhood, often you have that fragmentation. It's like a process of disassociation because the part of you that is meant to be the observer is too young at that time. It doesn't have, it does not know how to witness what is happening to you. And so it, even though it's still part of you, do you know what I mean? Like it just can't handle it. So it separates from the part that has experienced the trauma and has no choice, like has no escape. There's a part of you that has no escape and then there's a part of you that does have an escape. And the part that has an escape disassociates and then kind of pushes that piece away and it's just so that we can survive and we can keep going, right? And then that repeating trauma is like there's a piece of us a piece of our soul a piece of our consciousness that is looping around in that trauma over and over and over and over and over and especially if it happened in secret if it was something that other people didn't witness or if you were invalidated in your experience of it like pe people the people in your life like maybe it was not even necessarily like a terrible trauma where somebody abused you let's say it was a, a trauma where you were in um, some kind of accident or something scary happened. So people saw it happen. So it was witnessed with eyeballs, but you weren't validated in the way that it is affecting you. It still has the same, it's the same thing where like that piece needs to be, needs to be witnessed properly, like needs to be seen and validated in the way that it is uniquely suffering in order for the spell to break and that peace to be set free from just looping around in the trauma forever. So that's how it works in this life, right? Which is then why so many of us have to do shadow work and inner child healing in our adulthood because when we were children, we just didn't know how to deal with it. And so we that's what happened. Um, but then we have to go back and find that piece of ourself that is just reliving the nightmare over and over and over. And like walk it out of the nightmare so that we no longer like that piece of us that's looping is the piece that keeps generating these shitty patterns over and over in our lives because it's just like it's so powerful in its um, trauma signals and then we could also say too that it's trying to attract attention to itself so that we can come back and look at it and see it and process it. And it happens the same way in our Akashic history as well. So sometimes we have really profound Akashic traumas that are um, still affecting us, even if we can't, we can't put our finger on it, right? So I'll give you my own personal example. So 
in my life, I had some really weird relationship patterns I've, I've talked about before. Just um, sometimes they were pretty extreme. Like I have been in abusive relationships, but mostly they were just with normal people. But the way it was playing out was that I could not like, I don't know. All I wanted was to have a family. That was all I wanted was to just have family, meet my person, have a family, meet my person, have a family. That was it. And, um, I just kept feeling like I was meeting the wrong people. And it really didn't make any sense why this was happening and why it was such a pattern. And it was such a fucking problem for me because my parents are still married. Uh, You know, they have a human relationship, meaning like it's not perfect, but it's not terrible. Uh, They have, they have a good relationship. I, as their child, I wish there are things that I could tell them (laughs) because that just children forever, I think, want to see their parents love each other um, more and more consciously. However, they had a very good relationship in terms of I had a secure childhood. I got to observe two people working together and being kind to each other. They really never fought in front of us. They didn't even bicker in front of us. So first of all, I got modeled that. Then both um, my grandparents on both sides were also married all the way through their lives. There wasn't, it's not like I had my young psyche impressed with perceptions of romantic partnerships that don't work. So it didn't make sense in this life. And then both of my younger sisters who were raised in the exact same household, the exact same way, neither of them had a problem with it. They both met their partner very young and um, got married and they just are, you know, living very happy, happy, normal lives. For me, it took so much work, so much internal work to clear out that pattern and meet somebody. And then there was also the weird pattern of seeming like I could never meet somebody that wanted to have kids with me. It was wild. It was so bizarre. And what it created was a a very difficult and painful fertility journey, which I won't go deeply into. But if you want to hear more about it, I'm hosting a masterclass next week, next Monday for free about manifesting the child of your dreams. Um, So I will go more deeply into it there. But what I uncovered at a certain point was that I had had a past life where I was married to somebody who was very cruel and very controlling and very abusive in all the ways. He was abusive to me and he was abusive to our children. I think we had seven children. And he was mostly abusive to me though. Um, And he somehow like he made an accusation against me that and it was a long time ago, like maybe in the 1500s, something like that, 1400s, 1500s. So I had no rights as a woman at that time. He made an accusation that justified me being locked away in, it felt like a tower. Like, I don't think it was a dungeon. It felt like a tower. But regardless, I was locked away for the rest of my life and I was never allowed to see my children again. And it was a false accusation and something like an an accusation that I was trying to harm my kids or poison them or something like that. Um, And I went insane in that life. Like I went insane because of the extreme distress of being separated from my children. So I uncovered that memory and I did a ton of work on it. And like so much work, so much work. And I brought her to a place of being like being at peace and being happy and being reunited with her children. And that is part of what allowed me to then manifest my children. Um, But recently she has come up again and I'm like, what? Like how, why is this, is this still happening So I went into my Akashic Records and I saw a memory from Lemuria that allowed me to understand that the first memory was not the first incident. So no matter how much work I did on it, there was a deeper wound that I now have to see now in order to clear it out. And that first memory was of having my husband killed and being taken into um, slavery and having my children taken away and into slavery and separated from me in the Lemurian time. And I've seen that in a handful of other, like I said, about maybe 10 to 20 other um, people's Akashic records. 
as well, but I could never see myself there. It felt like I was always reading somebody else. Well, I was reading somebody else's Akashic Records, but I didn't see myself there until just this time because I wasn't ready to see it. So that pattern has continued to echo out into this lifetime, despite the fact that there really is no root cause in this lifetime for it to be playing out as intensely as it is. And the reason I want to share about Lemuria right now, I mean, it's a whole entire um, culture, I'll call it, or maybe civilization, like it's more than a society, more than a community, it's bigger than that. And there's so much to be seen. But this is the particular wound that is coming forward for me right now. And I feel like it's extremely important to um, reunite families is what it feels like to me. It feels extremely important to see and acknowledge that wound and the devastation that that caused and the um, trajectory it set us on. Like when I talk about the original, I don't know, I have a lot of new followers lately. So if you're a new follower, hey, some of this may make sense, some of it may not. But often I talk about the original divine blueprint of humanity. It's information that I've been getting since 2020, where I've been starting to see like, oh, this is actually how humans were created to work. And we aren't even closely resembling that right now. And most of it is through the chakras, through the activation of all of our chakras. Um, but for example, like we are supposed, we're not supposed to communicate verbally. We're supposed to communicate telepathically and we do so through our third eye, our heart and our sacral. And so we don't actually need to use words to communicate and it's extremely inefficient and it's actually, um, it creates more of a sense of separation. I think that, and, and basically, um, a lot of darkness, I don't know, I could use the word evil, but again, like I just want to stay away from these polarizing terms. I don't want to create a sense that there's like a bad guy that we all have to be afraid of. But it's important that we understand the story that we're playing out so that we can participate in the completion of the story, if that makes sense. So in this story that we are playing out, and just as a reminder, at higher dimensional levels, this is only a story and we are all a united consciousness. But at this level, we are currently very fragmented. So this story that we are playing out, this painful story, um, in it, this invading force basically came in and scrambled our shit, separated our families, like destroyed our communities um, and our connections with each other. And they basically inserted astral implants into our individual and collective astral bodies that interfere with the functioning of our chakras so that we are sort of disconnected from our heart so that our third eye like pretty much everybody knows about the calcification of the third eye so we can't transmit um, thought pictures and images to each other anymore for communication it's separated it they've severely severely wounded our sacral chakra um, so that we still engage in sacral telepathy, but we're doing it in ways that reflect the depth of our, um, our sexual and sensual wounding. So we're a very dysfunctional group of people now. And so we can't communicate telepathically the way that we're supposed to, and we're restricted to using words, which is very choppy and very inefficient and only actually increases the perception of being separate from each other. So that's what I mean by the original divine blueprint. There is a way that we are actually built and it's something that we can reclaim and recover, but we have to remember what it is first and then go through the process of reclaiming it. And that is our, that's what I see as being Lemurian. And so right now, it feels to me like relationships are of a very high priority and I'm aware, I'm pretty sure Venus is still in retrograde. As I've said many times, I'm not an astrologer. I really don't follow it, but it's impossible to not see it on Instagram. <laughs> but well, with the people I follow anyway. Um, so I'm aware that Venus is in retrograde and it 
I feel like that probably has something to do with these memories coming up. But, you know, in earlier months, I felt like it was really important to talk about manifesting money and liberating ourselves from the confines of feeling enslaved to the monetary system. Now that feels like it's shifted. And what is really important is reuniting broken relationships. So what that means is essentially I feel like what I'm being guided to do is reunite the fragmented families and um, relation relationship units from the Lemurian time but that also plays out through the story arcs of other lifetimes so it's like the reuniting of soulmates and I cannot believe I'm about to use this word on Instagram I can't or this term I can't believe it but I'm gonna say it it also means processing twin flame relationships there's just so much superstition around twin flames that keeps people locked in like horrible patterns of codependency that that's why I avoid using that term but it there is the the kind of relationship that that term is describing is a thing that we are experiencing for a reason because there is there are a lot of strands of I guess I could call it karma but that's not really it but it's like soul entanglement that is waiting to be wrapped up because to bring it back to recent lives that I've done if you have watched them, maybe you have, maybe you haven't, but I have been talking about this realization I had at the in February of 2022 that we are in the process of being transited. It's like the message was we're already on the ships, which is a fourth dimensional vehicle, so to speak. And the way I understood it was like, it's almost like we are in a simulation which in so many ways I actually believe that we are. And I don't think it's an artificial intelligence simulation. I don't think it's, I, I believe that it is a simulation of God. So I'm not meant to, not meaning to make this sound like we're literally plugged into the horrible matrix. Um, but we are in this beautiful organic holographic simulation. And there is a version of us that is outside of the simulation. And that version is in a... It's almost like a medically induced coma right now. And the simulation that we used to be living, so the, the like, let's say the whole Lemurian, like, world is over. It's gone. The simulation that we were once living is gone. And we are being transited to a new simulation. Another way of understanding it that isn't perfect, but was an amazing analogy that was offered by... Alex Gibson, um, who is just like a podcast listener and um, a follower, and we've been in conversations. She's been in a few of my programs. She referred to it as almost like if we were switching the game from like an old, like a PlayStation 3 to a PlayStation 5, then we are building the quantum bridge between. So it's the same game, but on an upgraded console. And we like, we, meaning those of us that are in the process of ascending our consciousness, we are building a quantum bridge that allows the continuity of our consciousness to move to that other console. And like I said, that's not a perfect analogy because we're not moving from one location to another. It's we're moving to from one level of consciousness to another. But regardless, I thought that was a brilliant analogy that she offered. But it's like we're in a medically induced coma and we are traversing this quantum bridge uh, to another level of consciousness. And in this new level of consciousness, there is another golden age that is waiting for us. A beautiful, it feels like a beautiful paradise. Like the other night in between like sleeping and waking, I had this kind of oh, like, I don't know, you could call it a dream. It was the hypnagogic state. Um, and the dream was that we were we were all coming out of like this we like we were all underwater and we finally walked out from the water like all like humans walked out from the water and when we stepped out of the water it's like we all fell and it looked like we died but we didn't really die 
because our light bodies and our plasma bodies stood up and kept walking and we started walking up this beautiful hill and it left a pile of density behind us um but it wasn't it wasn't like the same thing as your body dying and your spirit going on it wasn't that it was like all of the physical structures of density that we used to require were no longer needed and so they fell away almost like a snake skin like shedding a snake skin and a fresh version of us stood up out of that pile of old snake skin and we walked out and we walked up this beautiful hill and at the summit of the hill was like the most I can't even I don't know how to describe it because it was so beautiful and so I feel like we're moving back there but man we have some we have some story lines to heal and wrap up and a lot of the healing to me feels like we have to find the happy ending like when I think about those Lemurian people and you know that thousands and thousands of years ago I mean time isn't even real but whatever you know what I mean eons ago whatever these families were separated and each of them have this painful wound and this desire like I even wonder if that's why a lot of people that feel like they are star seeds feel homesick if it's like it could be from being a star seed and your planet being gone but it can also be from the Lemurian period and being completely separated from your home and your family and your your culture and everything that you know which again then has repeated itself in humanity countless countless times but it's almost like in order to end this we have to find the happy ending it's time for the happy ending the beautiful ending where people get to, souls get to come back together and our heart gets to be fulfilled and we're no longer feeling that yearning anymore for something that isn't there there's a woman who does um, amazing work to connect soulmates. Her Instagram handle is um, Izzy Living, I S S Y Living. And she talks about like the mermaid wound and the high priestess wound. And she talks about like how basically reuniting with your soulmate is like basically like your, it's one of your most powerful acts in dismantling the matrix, the false matrix. And I'm really, really feeling that. And myself, I'm here for the babies and I've always been here for the babies. So it also feels to me like allowing ourselves to be united and reunited with the children that we feel are ours, that we feel in our heart is also part of it. And sometimes that's through pregnancy. Sometimes though, it is through um, fostering adoption, um, like blended family situations, you know, but you just know when you know when you meet that child or you meet that baby or like you know that there is a deeper connection. You are always supposed to come back together. So anyway, I just thought I would come on and just share some of this stuff in case anybody else is feeling it and just feeling um like I talked about it in my Facebook group earlier today too, like there's also these huge waves of heart opening that's happening and heart opening sounds great, doesn't it? But it's actually, for me anyway, it's quite heavy and painful because in order to truly open your heart all the way, then that means you have to open yourself up to feel everything. And there are a lot of things that we have not allowed ourselves to fully feel um, that are waiting for us. And there's no way but to feel it all. And so it, it can just feel like, I don't know, I don't know how you're all feeling. I also don't want to project this onto anyone, but I just want to offer it and share it because that's kind of what I've decided to show up and do with this, with my podcast and my social media, um, is that if you are feeling a heaviness, if you're feeling a grief, if you're feeling like 
tenderness around your children or tenderness around your spouse, or if you're not in a relationship, you really miss somebody or you really want to be in a relationship, all that is being activated. I'm sure it has to do with Venus retrograde, but I'm just offering that it might also have to do with a lot of Akashic history that goes all the way back to Lemuria, whether you were necessarily there or not. It set us all on a trajectory of continuously being separated from each other. And I guess that's the point. It took me fucking forever to get here as it happens. But we've been set on a trajectory of being continuously separated from each other. And our love being like the love bonds that we are designed to share being broken, severed, like whatever, you know, it plays out in a multitude of ways. And it really feels to me right now, like this is finally the time. This is finally, finally the time where we now get to be all brought back together. Like we were separated into a billion shards of a broken mirror. And now all the pieces get to come back together and fit together perfectly in all their puzzle piece places. And we get to feel reunited as a whole. But where we're at right now is like the coming back together of those deep primal relationships and those deep primal bonds of love that have been at best (laughs) playing out in very human wounded ways. Anyway, so to that end, I hope this was, I don't know, I hope this was of value or something interesting to at least one of you. Let me know in the comments if it resonates or not. Um, but if, if any of it does resonate and if you are feeling like you feel that in yourself, like you're feeling really, really like you want to reconnect with the person, a person, it doesn't even have to be romantically. Like it really doesn't. It just feels like relationships are the thing right now. Relationships are the thing. If you are feeling that, um, and especially if you're feeling that around children or babies, family, whatever, but it can be love, it can be your estranged parents, any of it, then I invite you to join me in my free masterclass that is happening next Monday. Um, I think it's called manifest your pregnancy baby child. But as I said, like, I will tell you how to do it, but that information will be transferable to all of those scenarios. So if it's like manifest your, um, romantic relationship or it's manifest reuniting with your estranged sister, whatever, it'll apply to all of those scenarios. And I will tell you how. I'm not going to do the thing that we're trained to do as content creators and course creators. I'm not going to tell you the what and then be like, if you want to learn how to do it, you have to join my thing. I am going to invite you into a thing after, but I am going to tell you how to do it so that you can do it on your own because it just feels super uncool and not fair to do it the other way. And if you are going through it right now and you want to know about your own Akashic history, then I have two options available for you. The high-end VIP Cadillac option is um, I have 10 remaining single Akashic sessions open, meaning that you just buy one session, we have one session, and that's it. It is very high level VIP service that includes five um, days together through voice and text chat to prepare for the session as well as to debrief and integrate and answer any follow-up questions, whatever, after. Um, And these are like my premium highest quality offer. I'm only ever doing 10 more and then I'm switching to only working in packages where we have repeated calls because it's just... a. I feel like there's so there's always so much more to go into even after a two hour call. Um, so you can book that. The link is in my bio. Otherwise, if you want to learn how to read your own Akashic records, I have a program called Into the Akasha. It's super good, super deep. And I also incorporate practice sessions where we practice together and then we troubleshoot 
whatever's coming up so that if you feel blocked in the Akashic Records, which a lot of people do for a whole multitude of reasons, it doesn't mean you can't read them. It just means that more support is needed to understand the blockage and how to work around it and how to work through it. So um, I think the link for that is my bio too, but maybe I'll put it in my stories after. Um, so those are ways to work together if you're interested. And if not, then I hope that you enjoyed this live and found it interesting at very least. Um, I love you all. I hope that you're surviving this very, very, very emotional period of heart opening. I honestly feel like there is no end in sight. <laughs> and it is going to continue for who knows how long, as long as it has to, for us to fully drop into our hearts. I think we're experiencing a collective pole shift right now where we are shifting from the polarity, the masculine polarity of the mind down the wounded masculine polarity of the mind. By the way, there is an exalted polarity of the mind, the masculine polarity of the mind, but we've been in the wounded one and we're shifting out of the wounded masculine polarity of the mind down into the exalted um, healed feminine polarity of the heart and then we will from there be able to heal the polarity uh, masculine polarity of the mind so I feel like we're just gonna keep going through this process of feeling all the accumulated feels of every time we have ever shoved down an emotion or cut ourselves short not let ourselves cry to the bitter bitter final tear but we you know like splashed water on our faces and got ourselves together so that we could go carry on with whatever we thought we had to do or felt like we had to do. Um, all of that is waiting for us. And I think that's what we're moving through. And maybe that feels like a bummer to hear. It feels like a bummer to me because it's been rough. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but I just, I know that, um, I know that it is what we have to do. I know that's that's the only option moving forward and it's awaiting all of us awake or not. So anyway, thank you if you're here. Thank you for your service. Thank you for being present with your heart and I love you. And I hope you have an amazing week. Bye everyone. <laughs>